Hello and welcome to The Bookmonger. I'm John J. Miller of National Review. Thanks for listening. This show is a production of National Review and we're recording from the studio of WRFH, the campus radio station of Hillsdale College. Our guest is Jeannie Safer, author of I Love You But I Hate Your Politics, How to Protect Your Intimate Relationships in a Poisonous Partisan World. Jeannie, how common a problem is political disagreement within a marriage or a family relationship, and how severe is this problem? It's unbelievable, John, and it's getting worse by the day. I, actually, I was shocked when I started talking to people and trying to find people to interview that everybody had a story. I mean, just as an example, I was walking through the Green Market in, in Union Square in, in New York yesterday, and I was telling one of the farmers that I always said, deal with, you know, that I had this book, and he said, oh, you should hear my stepmother. She's 65, and she's constantly ready to kill her 95-year-old mother. <laughs> you, 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 you touch somebody, and they, everybody has a story, people you would never imagine. I, I mean, one, one experience I had uh, was at a dinner with a, a, a lot of very seriously conservative Republicans in, in Palm Beach, and I was sitting next to this fascinating man. He was a retired general from the Marines. And when I told him about the book, he said his whole demeanor changed. Very smart, interesting guy. And he said, I lost a 60-year-old friendship over this. He said, when I voted for Trump, my oldest, dearest friend stopped talking to me. And I said, well, what did you do about it? You know, suddenly, you're, you're, you know, you're intimate with people because they've never talked to anybody about these things, typically. And he said, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid to approach him because if I do it wrong, I'll lose him forever. And I said, look, I don't know you. I don't know him. But don't let this go. You can always say you really matter to me. I don't want this to destroy us. So I really want to know what happened with him. But this is a very common thing. It's astonishing because, you know, even though the rate of mixed marriage has gone from 20% in the end of the last century when I did it myself uh, with someone we will talk about, um, it's now 9% and going down. So most people never even meet somebody from the other party. But still, they've got family members, they have colleagues, you know, and it's just vicious. People can't control themselves. And um, the reason that I actually got inspired to write this book was that I started getting emails from people. Now, I've, I've written about this topic for many years because it's been my life for many years. But I started getting letters from, for emails from people, um, mostly Trump-supporting men, interestingly enough. Desperate. They, the, the letters would go, I have a new girlfriend. She's a liberal. I know you're a liberal. I read something you wrote online about this. And such and such happened. What do I do? Um, the, the story that truly inspired me was the first letter that I got, which was from a guy. He said, I met this woman. I love her. She's wonderful. She's everything I ever wanted. They were both in their 50s, and they both had pretty tough relationships before. He said, so about our second month, we had everything in common. We never talked about politics particularly. But the second month, um, my car was parked in a way that she could see the back uh, rear view mirror in the back windshield. And she noticed that I have a comical decal of Trump urinating on Hillary Clinton. She said, it's a joke. And she said she was so outraged that she told him if he didn't take it off, she would leave him. And so he writes to me and said, what should I do? <laughs> well, what do you do? What advice do you give in a situation like that? The, 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 the new Dear Abby. Well, what I said to him, um, he was obviously a charming guy, you know, and, and they really did seem to have a lot in common. I said, dear sir, civility rules. If this is so offensive to her, remove it. And he did. And then she wrote me. And this is interesting, John, because what, what she wrote me, she said she was overwhelmed with gratitude to me, but also to him, because clearly she mattered to him, and her feelings mattered to him. And that's what it meant to her. So it wasn't just the obnoxious decal, which it, he, you know, he also had said to me, you know, if, if uh, she had a decal with, with Hillary urinating on Trump, I wouldn't mind. And I said, well, people are different, you know. 
But what really mattered to her was that he cared enough to take her opinion into account. And this is the thing that I saw over and over again, the real value that people wanted to see in their partner was that. And when that was there, they didn't care who they voted for so much. You're listening to The Bookmonger, a production of National Review, and I want to tell you about National Review Plus. With NR Plus, you get unlimited access to National Review's digital magazine. That means no paywall, all the issues in a 10-year archive, and all the podcasts. But it's more than a digital subscription. It's a membership that includes access to our members-only Facebook page, members-only conference calls with NR writers, editors, and guests. Members-only commenting on the site and a lot fewer ads, including known within articles. To learn more, please go to nationalreview.com slash NRPLUS. And Jeannie, here's where we got to make this personal. Uh, you're a liberal. <laughs> You're married to a conservative. My National Review colleague, Richard Brookheiser, who's been on this podcast. How long have you guys been married? We've been married for 39 years, I think it is. And uh, I've been part of the National Review extended family for about 42, actually. So how do you do it? How do you as a liberal <laughs> make it work? I, I imagine Rick is hard to live with for all kinds of reasons, but but, but how, how, how do you guys make the politics of this, John, of this work for you, or, 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 or at least not work against you? The politics is the least of it, the po- because first of all, I don't know if I could live with everybody who hit Rick's opinions. But Rick gives it the office. You know, he has colleagues, he has plenty of people to talk to, and he's also a very gracious, um, he's, he's an outspoken person, but I don't think he's as out there as I am. And so he never, I don't think it would have ever been a problem for him. It was a problem for me, because I change people's minds for a living. I'm a psychoanalyst. And here was the man I loved, and, and, and you know, uh, was the the perfect person for me in every other way. And he had all of these opinions that I found really outrageous. And then it took me, I would say, frankly, it took me about 10 years to learn what not to say, which was mostly everything about politics. (laughs) Because, you know, when you live with somebody that long and you see that they show up for you and they care about you and they take care of you, their, their position on gun control, et cetera, becomes secondary. I mean, it's not that I don't still disagree and have passionate feelings about those things, but it's in the context of a relationship where I feel loved as I never imagined I could be loved by anyone. What dating advice do you have for young conservatives and young liberals who are attracted to each other? The advice I have is don't run the opposite direction because you have different politics. You know, politics are embedded in a personality. It's the personality that counts. You could have somebody who had exactly the same politics, and so many people have, who turned out not to be on your side, or when you really needed something, they weren't there, or they didn't treat you well. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. You have to learn, and you have to talk to each other about how you're going to talk about politics. I have a criteria for a relationship, and this is a relationship. It's not, obviously, it's with somebody who's your, your life partner, uh, but it's even, even somebody who's going to be your dear friend. And Rick, my very articulate husband, coined this. He called it the chemotherapy test. The chemotherapy test, which we have both had occasion to discover, is this. You don't ask the party registration or affiliation of the person who is standing by your bedside when you're getting chemotherapy. You do not ask that question when that person is getting you through it. And I think that's what counts. Showing up, being there. This is, I have a chapter called What is the Core Value? That is the corest of core values. And I talk to a lot of people who had this experience, who, who you know, were, were betrayed by people that, that agreed with them and supported and loved and taken care of by people who didn't, and it changed their minds. I mean, that's a change of mind that I think we can all actually make, is to be open-minded to the personality, to the values, to the decency of someone across the aisle, like uh, Ginsburg and Scalia did. 
last question. We're almost out of time. As I was reading your book, I was reminded of the of the of the saying, "Politics is downstream from culture." But I started wondering, is politics downstream from psychology? No, but psychology in relationships is much more important than politics because one of the points in my book, John is that these fights that people get into, these insane fights, thrusting articles across the breakfast table, yelling and screaming, unfriending everybody, their parents, their great-grandmothers, you know, on Facebook, is really not a political issue. It's a psychological issue. Because if it was only a political issue, we could never have close friendships with people who disagree with us. The, the biggest issue in these terrible fights is that we're always trying to change the other person's mind. We want them to agree with us. Once we get over that, and that's a big want, that's a very tough thing. That's what a lot of the book is about. Once we accept that we cannot change their mind, then we can listen to them. Then we can have an actual conversation and not a screaming match. And that's what I want people to take from this book, that there really is hope. By changing your own attitude and thinking about it, you can change these fights into conversations and save a lot of relationships that are really worth saving. The author is Jeannie Safer. The book is I Love You But I Hate Your Politics, How to Protect Your Intimate Relationships in a Poisonous Partisan World. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy, Delighted to be here. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes. Your reviews help new listeners discover us, and it helps us keep this show going. We'll be back next week with a new episode of The Bookmonger.